over the next few weeks. And we're going to uh, study some of the I am statements that we find in John's gospel. You might be asking yourself, well, what is an I am statement? Uh, John uh, wants, uh, through his writing, to show that Jesus is God. And so he kind of refers back to uh, the Old Testament when Abraham uh, was speaking to God at the burning bush. And he said, well, if I've got to go to the Israelites in Egypt, who am I going to say has sent me? And God says, tell them, I am has sent you. And so when we get into uh, the New Testament, Jesus uses these statements to describe different aspects of his character uh, and who he is. And so, for example, we have, uh, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I am the way and the truth and the life. Uh, I am the bread of life and so on. Today, following on from Easter uh, last week, this um, in some places they call Blue Sunday because quite often we have loads of people on Easter Sunday and everybody's all excited and woo! And then the following Sunday, it's like, oh, here we go, back to normal. Okay? And so we call it Blue Sunday. But following on from Easter, I want to look at the statement of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. It's the thing that we use um, as ministers at funerals uh, quite regularly. Um, and it's important, significant. I don't really want to think about it in terms of future and you'll see why in a minute. And just to be clear, in case you don't know, resurrection is when something that's dead comes back to life. I was going to make a joke at Russell's expense about Rangers, but um, <laughs> I, thought, I thought then maybe that was just a bit cruel. Um, so, but I, I do want to look at, at three different ways in which um, things inside us can die and the power of God can bring them back to life. The, the prelude to the bit that we read is a story about a man called Lazarus and his sisters and they were friends with Jesus. But Lazarus had become ill, so ill in fact that they knew he was going to die. So Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus uh, about the condition their brother was in and expected that he would come and help this was the bad news in the middle of uh, a good life. And maybe Easter was a struggle for you because while everyone else was celebrating, there was something for you that was bad news and you couldn't shake it and you couldn't get rid of it. So here we are in this story and Jesus does something unexpected. On hearing the news about Lazarus, he tells his disciples that this whole incident is designed by God to bring him glory. He says that this very thing that you would never want to happen is actually going to be used to bring him glory. And you know, God does that with us. The very thing that we don't want to happen can become that very thing that God uses to bring glory his name. Jesus hears the news and rather than rushing off to go to be with Lazarus, he does nothing. He stays where he is and just waits. Now, put yourself in the disciples' position, right? What would I be doing? I'd be going, uh, time's getting on. You don't, you don't think maybe we should, not, should go now? You know, Lazarus, you know, you remember Lazarus? Lazarus, your pal, you know, you know Laz, Lazzy baby, you know him? Well, he's no well, maybe we should, you know, think maybe Jesus, we should, you know? And you'd be doing all that kind of stuff. And Jesus just sat there and did nothing. He just stayed where he was. Two days later, he decides, let's go to Judea because... Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now, it doesn't mean that he's having a nap. Lazarus is dead. And only now is Jesus going to go and do something about it. There are three people in the story that I want to look at. 
because something inside them has, has died. The first one is one of the disciples. It's Thomas. The other is Mary and Martha. All three were dying on the inside. And, and maybe there's something th in their story that you might uh, relate to. Thomas is more commonly called Doubting Thomas. He was the one who missed out when Jesus appeared to the other disciples and he said, no, unless I can put my finger in the holes in his hands and his feet, unless I can see him and touch him, I'm not going to believe. And so ever since, poor Thomas has been called Doubting Thomas. He one mistake <laughs> and you're labeled for life and for, well, <laughs> for, for 2,000 years, right? So be careful what you do, right? Just, just a word of advice. Doubting Thomas doesn't believe. And the, the disciples and, and Thomas were conscious that the last time Jesus had been in uh, Judea, they tried to stone him. And what they're thinking is, you know, here we're going back to Judea where they don't really like you. And on top of that, you've done absolutely nothing to help your friend. How do you think they're going to respond this time? And Thomas perhaps sarcastically said, Oh, well, let's just all go and die with Lazarus. Because he could not see how God was going to work in this circumstance and situation. He doubted who Jesus was. Now, I wonder how many of us would be brave enough to say, Do you know, there have been times in my life when I've, I've doubted things. I suspect if you haven't, you might not be being totally uh, honest. I think everybody has doubts at different times in their walk with God. Perhaps God didn't answer a prayer in the way you expected. Maybe there are bits of the Bible that you find really difficult to understand when you look back from our contemporary perspective. And attitudes and, and everything are so different. Maybe something really bad happened to somebody that you love and, and you, you don't know why God just didn't stop it. And suddenly, you're a bit like Thomas. There's something on the inside that becomes dead with doubt. Or maybe you're a bit more like Mary. You're not dead in your doubt you're dead in discouragement. You don't see good things happening in your life. You look at other people and you see them on fire for God. You think, well, why not me? You think, I think Mary was really discouraged. In verse 20, we're told that when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she ran out to meet him. And Mary stayed at home. It's as if she's saying, well, why bother? What's the point? What's the point of going out there? I mean, he's already dead. There's nothing you can do. It's too late. It's done. And we can't change it. And maybe that's how some of you here today feel. I can't change it. I'm always going to feel this way. I'm always going to feel alone. I'm always going to be stuck in this dead-end job. I'm never going to have that marriage that I thought I would have, the family that I thought I would have, the relationships that I would love to have. I'm just kind of stuck here. And you're discouraged. Of course, this is church, so you would never show it. You do the oh yes, I'm fine. And actually, it's not true. Some are dead in doubt. Some are dead in discouragement. Martha was dead in the delay. Jesus simply had taken too long. He should have come earlier, and he didn't. By the time he arrived, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And that's a very significant, um, you know, you, you sometimes wonder why 
uh, gospel writers put in these wee bits. Four days, what's the significance of that? Well, it's very significant because for them and their culture, a body, when it died, was emptied of its spirit. But the spirit hung around for three days just in case something happened and it could get back into the body. But on the fourth day, the spirit left and couldn't get back in to the body. Now, that's not a biblical uh, belief. It's not a Christian belief. It's a kind of um, folklore thing that they believed in those days. But what it means is that Lazarus was not just dead. He was really dead. He was absolutely, totally, utterly, completely deceased. There was no going back at four days. The, the, the King James Version has a lovely wee phrase that uh, uh, Martha says when Jesus says, let's open the tomb. She says, he stinketh. That's, not, that's brilliant. He stinketh. I've often wanted to say that to somebody. You, know, you stink. But anyway. <laughs> but, but you can imagine, you know, they're, they're, they're there. They're at the, they're at the tomb. And in the heat, even although it's, you know, the, the tomb there, that you can imagine that after four days, there would be a fairly obnoxious uh, smell. They couldn't understand why Jesus had waited. Why, when he had done so many other miracles, why, when he had healed so many other people, had he not come immediately to heal his friend? Somebody who loved him, somebody who had spent time with him, somebody who had trusted him, somebody who followed him. Why had he not come and done that? Why the delay? And maybe some of you can relate to some of that. Why has God delayed answering your prayers? You've been faithful. You've been patient. Maybe you're praying for somebody to come to faith. Maybe you're praying for somebody to be healed because you believe that with God, all things are possible. And yet, somehow, God has not answered your prayer. Why is he waiting? Why the delay? And something inside you begins to die in the delay. Well, what I want to stress to you this morning is this, that because God hasn't done it yet, doesn't mean that he is not still in control and has a plan through which, through that very thing that you are struggling with, he is going to bring glory to his name. You see, in verse 22, Martha says this. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She looks at Jesus and says, I know that even now, even though we are dead in our delay or dead in our discouragement or dead in our doubts, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Some of us today need to have an even now moment with God. Even now when you're discouraged, the presence of God can come in and build up your faith. Even now when you feel alone, like there's no one there, the presence of the Holy Spirit can give you peace that passes all human understanding. Even now God can reach into your family and bring healing and harmony and forgiveness and restoration. Even now when everything looks impossible, we serve a God who says all things are possible for those who believe. Even now when your heart might be cold and callous towards the things of God, God can in a moment soften your heart and draw you into his presence. Even now, when there is something that is dead, the resurrection power of Jesus can bring it back to life. And that's what Jesus did for Lazarus. 
He says to Martha, your brother will rise again. And they believed that. They believed at the end of days there would be a resurrection for God's people, that they would come back uh, from the dead. But it was for some distant point in the future. It wasn't for now. And so when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, notice he doesn't say, I can resurrect. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. The resurrection is not an event, it's a person, it's Jesus. And so Jesus, the resurrection, tells them to roll the stone away from the front of the tomb and calls out to Lazarus, and Lazarus comes out from the tomb alive. And so today, if you've lost hope, or faith, or if you feel dead in the delay, if you're discouraged, or if you've got doubts, and you feel like you don't have the strength to roll the stone away on your own, the good news for you is that it's already been rolled away, because Christ rolled it away at Easter, when He rose from the dead, the resurrection and the life. He did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. And the voice that called out to Lazarus, is the same voice that calls out today. Your sins can be forgiven, not because you are good, but because he's good. You can be set free, not because you're strong, but because he's strong. You can feel his presence, not because you deserve it, but because he longs to be with you. The resurrection is not what he does. It's who he is. And why does any of that matter? Because God and his love and his mercy did that very thing that we were incapable of doing for ourselves. He became one of us. God in the flesh, born of a virgin. And why is that important? Why is the virgin birth important? Why does it matter? Because Jesus didn't inherit the sinful nature from his father. He inherited the pure, divine nature from his heavenly Father. That meant that he could be the perfect sacrifice that we needed to pay the price for sin. Nobody realized it at the time. But Jesus dying on the cross brought glory to God the Father and to himself. So whatever you're struggling with today, why don't you ask God to show you how he is going to work it out and to show you how he's going to bring glory to his name through it. I'm not suggesting that everything will work out and everything will go well for the rest of your life. But I do believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I believe that he longs to resurrect dreams and ambitions, hopes and faith and love. He calls us to be persistent in faith and in prayer. He calls us to love him and to receive the blessing of his presence, even in the darkest of times. He wants what's best for us. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you that you are so good and so big that you know the intimate details of every situation of every person here today. I pray that by your power, the power of the resurrection, you would intervene right now, spiritually speaking, for those who are hurting and who feel alone. I pray that you would be their ever-present help in time of trouble, that even right now your Holy Spirit would be their comforter and bring a peace that goes beyond our ability to understand. We know that everything doesn't always happen the way we want, but I thank you that you're a God who works in all things to bring about good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. I pray that you would give us the strength to hang on and the faith to believe that there's better to come, And that you would be glorified through the things that are hard for us to understand today. Father, would you build our faith. 
Help us realize that you are ultimately good in every way. We praise you for the hope of eternal life with you that comes through faith in Jesus. But we also give thanks that resurrection and life are not just for some distant point in the future. They're for right here and right now. As we listen, would you help us to hear that same voice that called Lazarus from the tomb, saying to us, come out. There's forgiveness. There's grace. There's healing. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how big your doubts are, how bad you've been, how alone you feel, how much you've messed up. I love you, and I'm for you, and I have the ability and the power to transform life. Amen. We're going to sing uh, another hymn in closing. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship. But if you uh, would like somebody to pray with you about anything at all, then if you wait in here after the service, somebody will come and pray with you.